Here we're going to walk you through the steps in wavefront guided LASIK treatment programming using the Paramis wavefront sensor and the Schwind Amaris platform. But a lot of the comments I'm going to be making and the principles we're talking about here will be applicable to the Harpen Shack Aberometers and the other platforms too. So I hope it'll be useful more generally. What are the advantages of wavefront guided treatment? First of all, measurement precision. Repeatability of measurements is about twice as good as manifest refraction if you're using modern aberometers. And they protect from human error both in that way and also very importantly by porting the data directly between the scanner and the planning software and the laser itself. So this protects from a transcription error, typing in the wrong number or the wrong sign. Also, unlike a wavefront compensated treatments where you're taking a one size fits all population mean figure to compensate for induced aberrations in LASIK, you're getting a tailored treatment here. But the advantage of that is, is pretty small. And if you add up all the aberrations together, the defocus equivalent of the third, fourth and higher order aberrations, it's about quarter of a diopter in normal eyes. So not a very big deal. And the real reasons for doing wavefront guided treatment, I think, revolve around measurement precision and protection from human error. And the measurement precision is particularly relevant to astigmatic results. The results for wavefront LASIK, generally this is a sample we looked at just very recently. That's uh, 265 pretty standard myopic cases, up to minus 10, up to four dots of cylinder. And around about 19 out of 20 of the eyes in the good group seeing 2020 or better and within half a doctor of the target spherical equivalent refraction and very good safety indices too. So it doesn't get much better than that. But most modern wavefront compensated platforms are achieving similar results where I think the wavefront guided treatments particularly stand out are in astigmatic accuracy. We were getting 97% of patients in this series within half a diopter of total cylinder. So one of the real advantages for wavefront guided treatments is astigmatic accuracy. So those are the reasons for doing it. And we're going to give you some tips on acquiring the scans here. First of all, I'd make the wavefront scan the first thing you do in the diagnostic scanning sequence before you get to the, any of the other scanners or tests so that the tear film is stable, not fatigued by repeated scans, and that way you're going to get more repeatable measurements. So make the wavefront scanning really the first thing you do in the diagnostic review. Don't combine the wavefront scans with topography. There's an option for that on, on many modern scanning systems. And it's best just to uh, decouple those and shoot off a quick scan sequence of wavefront scans first and standardize the patient instructions. So the patient knows not to tilt their head from one side to the other, keep their chin against the stop. They can blink freely, keep their eyes wide open at the right moments, all of that. So once we've acquired three scans, we've got to review them in the Phoenix software here, which we've got open. And we're going to focus on the treatment of the left eye of somebody who's in the presbyopic age group here uh, for an example treatment. And so the first thing to do is to right click on one of these scans here, and then you're going to get a dialog box drop down here and you're going to click on statistics on acquisitions. And then you see this information drop out here, which is very useful. There's some quality indicators of the scan over here. There's the spherical equivalent here. So you can see whether you've got three scans that are close together here. We're looking for a range within half a diopter. So that you can see the patient's not accommodating during the scan sequence. And here we've got the astigmatic or the cylinder components. You can see they're reasonably well aligned here and it gives you the range here of the absolute sill values. So we're going to click on the scan with the largest scan acquisition diameter, which is the way we choose the scan for treatment here. And provided there's nothing wrong with that scan, obviously in terms of it being an outlier compared to the other scans, then we, that's the scan we'll select for treatment. But there are other strategies for scan selection. 
you can choose the median scan of three, that's a commonly used strategy, or indeed the lowest dioptric spherical equivalent. And provided all the quality indicators here are good, then it's absolutely fine to use any of those strategies. Choose the one you want to use and stick with that. Then having chosen our scan, we can review it and then we can go up to the export button here, drop out this dialog box and export the scan. We'll get a summary panel here, press export, then you can navigate through the file software and drop that into place. And then we're on to the topography and we want to select a topography scan. This is much less important. It only really gives you the K values which are used by the laser to adjust the treatment energy in the periphery of the ablation area in relation to corneal curvature, the so-called cosine adjustment. And you can type those K values in if the topography scans are difficult to export. If, for example, you've got a shadow from the nose and your acquisition diameter is too small. And also it gives you information on the pupil offset from the corneal vertex. And that's useful in wavefront compensated treatments. But as you'll see just now, we're much less interested in that information for wavefront guided treatments. Again, we're going to right click here and we're going to drop out this dialog box, look at the scan sequence, look at the quality indicators here. And here we've quite clearly got one scan that's a little better than the others, but we've got a reasonable group in terms of pupil offset here. And so we're going to choose that first scan and we're going to send that through. Export again, going up to this button here, dropping out this dialog box here and press refractive export to Schwind pass through this Placido ring image here. You can click interpolate rings just to get a slightly larger diameter on that before you send that through. And then you get a summary panel here, which again, you can export down at the bottom here and archive that ready for importing into your treatment planning software. So that's how we've got our diagnostic scans reviewed and selected. So now we're over to the treatment planning software and we're going to go up to the ORK cam button here to open a blank treatment and we're going to select in the left eye the wavefront guided option here. Clicking on that we have to navigate through the system where we've archived the files we've exported from the diagnostic software. And a little tip here is just to navigate through that quickly by typing the first few letters of the patient's name which I've blanked out here for confidentiality into the bottom and then you'll quickly navigate through to the files that you need. The OSW file suffix here denotes the wavefront scan and the CSW file suffix denotes the keratometry scan and there's information about the date of the scan you've taken and which of the scans in sequence that you've taken here for extra checking. So you can open the wavefront file by double clicking here then we're going to find that our details drop in automatically, including the patient ID details, which are blanked out here again for confidentiality. And then the next task is to import the corneal data, this time by double clicking on the CSW file in exactly the same way. And that drops in automatically. And we've got our pupil offset data here and the keratometric data dropping in as well. And so now we're ready to proceed with the programming. There's a few things that I always do at this stage. Check the back vertex distance is correct. It is in fact 12 millimeters, the default value in this particular case. And then we go over to the pupil offsets. Now, wavefront driven treatments are acquired over the pupil and you want to put them back down centered on the pupil center. So you don't need to offset to the vertex. That's something that I debate quite regularly with Sam Arba Mosquera at Schwind, who is the guru of all things related to Schwind, wavefront and other treatment planning, and a very important source of advice for all of us on the Schwind platform. Sam says it doesn't make a lot of difference whether you do or don't do this. I do this out of habit from using other wavefront guided treatment platforms. I go to naught here, to make sure the treatment is centered over the pupil. The higher order aberrations, by the way, are not offset, even if you leave this offset in. So we're gonna click through and delete that, make that value naught. And we've checked our back vertex distance, and then we're ready to look at the nomogram adjustments here. 
For nomogram adjustment, we are going to go to our audit spreadsheet. We've got our UK national clinical data set fields laid out for us here. We've got our patient highlighted in pink with the eye that we're following through the treatment planning example in the bottom row here and the nomogram adjustment dropping out here. Now this is based on information from the manifest refraction on the left here and the preoperative aberometric refraction on the right here. And the problem in planning wavefront guided treatment is that these two figures never agree absolutely. We're talking about the difference here between measurement precision, which is a very strong area for the aberometers, that's measurement repeatability, and measurement accuracy, which is proximity to the true value. And a weaker area for modern aberometers is control over accommodation during the scan acquisition sequence. So really what you're asking your optometrist to do with the manifest refraction is to use all the tricks they have to neutralize accommodation in this measurement. And we have found that you can use multiple regression analysis to combine information from these two sources to make your sphere outcomes more accurate. And we've published our approach to this. I'll leave you with a reference at the end of the talk. But this derives a little macro up here that we use to drop out the nomogram adjustment here. And this is layered on top of the target sphere outcome here, which in this left eye of a patient in their mid 40s is going to be minus one. We're going for a micro monovision spread here. So we're gonna type this figure that we've highlighted in yellow here into our target sphere box in the treatment planning software. What about nomogram adjustments to the cylinder? Well, we found that we just don't need them for the Paramis system. We've looked at this and any adjustments we've derived from regression modeling have been too small to be clinically useful. But with some other systems, it's useful to make adjustments for the cylinder as well. And again, we've laid out how we do this in the reference that I'll leave you at the end of the talk. So we're going to type minus 1.34 into the target sphere box here, select Femto LASIK. We've already programmed the right eye. And then we're back on familiar ground for Schwind users who are used to programming aberration free treatments. The steps after this are exactly the same. We're going to click OK, tab through the check screens there, put in our pachymetry data for the right and the left eye here, hit the summary box. This software warning is just telling us that the optical zone is larger than the acquisition diameter for the wavefront scans. It commonly is, but provided that your wavefront scans have an acquisition diameter larger than 5.5 millimeters, there's no problem in going out to a default 6.5 zone. You're allowed up to a millimeter expansion on this. So you can type through this screen onto the final summary screens for all your checks. Looking at your target refraction here, you're just seeing the nomogram adjustment for the right eye here. And then the nomogram adjustment that we showed you earlier for the left eye, which incorporates the micromonovision target. And then you're ready to export and proceed with your treatment. So who gets a wavefront guided treatment in my practice? Well, we're looking for a good scan sequence here. That's three scans with a spherical equivalent range of less than 0.5 diopters between them. So good control over accommodation during the scan sequence. And we're looking for a large mesopic pupil size, something over 5.5 millimeters. And about 85% of our routine myopic treatments meet these criteria. For the older patients, the patients with smaller pupils, the hyperopic treatments, we're using aberration free treatments. And that's the default for most Schwind users who are using aberration free treatments for all their patients. And that achieves good results. So we're talking about small gains here, but I do believe that the protection from human error, that's making transcription errors. If you do enough treatments, sooner or later you'll make one of those is valuable. And I think the measurement accuracy is important, particularly for the cylinder. So I hope this video will give some Schwind users the confidence to use this capability on the platform. To understand deriving nomograms to modulate your sphere, well, look back at this reference here. It lays out all the steps for you. It's not complex. It's reasonably easy to do. And this is a, a really nice uh, little link here that Sam Arbor Mosquera from Schwind shared with me. It's the clearest explanation I've seen yet of the measurement of wavefront indices 
in both dioptric and micron terms. It's from the godfather of wavefront decomposition and ophthalmology, that's Larry Thybos, uh, a really nice guy who I met once in Italy. And uh, I think that if you look anywhere at his work, you'll find something useful, but this is particularly good. So do take a screenshot there and follow that link up. If you want to get going with wavefront guided treatments before you have any data for your own nomogram adjustments, well, we've found that whenever we've run the analysis, that the weighting coefficient on the difference between the manifest and the wavefront refraction spherical equivalent is always very close to 0.5. So if you simply split the difference between the manifest and the wavefront refraction spherical equivalent and use this to modulate your target sphere, then you won't be a million miles out. But always apply a sense check if your manifest refraction spherical equivalent is larger than your wavefront refraction spherical equivalent. You want to be adding a bit to your wavefront driven treatment. So you type a hyperopic target, a plus value into your target sphere box. And conversely, if the wavefront refraction spherical equivalent is actually higher than the manifest refraction spherical equivalent, so you've got a tiny bit of accommodation in the scans, then you want to be going for a myopic target, taking a little bit off the wavefront driven treatment there by typing a negative value into your target sphere box. Okay, so not necessarily a tune you'll get on first listen, but uh, I really hope there's something in there that will give the Schwind users, the majority of whom are only using aberration-free or wavefront compensated treatments, the confidence to explore this really useful capability on the Amaris platform. And I hope there's something of more general relevance too for users of other wavefront guided laser treatment platforms.